So one of the big things here with uh, computer vision right now is that there's a lot of moving parts. And so what, what's happening is that many people are, I guess in a way, almost uh, experimenting right with, with uh, computer vision. And the, a lot of the, the, the stuff that's happening is that there isn't necessarily a ton of progress. And, and I wanted to just address that real quick. Uh, in terms of what some of these issues are with um, with computer vision. So in terms of the emerging uh, issues with computer vision, uh, one thing that's happening is that the feedback loop uh, is is something that hasn't really been addressed with, with computer vision. And so let me just talk about this real quick. So computer vision uh, feedback loop. And so what, what do I even mean by this? Well, one of the issues right now is if you look at globally what's happening, one thing that almost in a way is uniting the world is that everybody has a common problem, right? We have COVID, people need to address it. There's all kinds of solutions out there. And at the same time, we have lots of tools that, that the world can use to to, to solve COVID. So one thing that we do know, for example, is that if you wear a mask, I, I think everybody is in agreement that the mask will prevent the, the spread of COVID, right? Because it eliminates the, you know, breathing and, and getting it places. But one of the issues that we have is that how do we know whether people are wearing the mask, right? So so we, we know that there's a, a solution to prevent the spread is, you know, how um, can we detect people not wearing a mask? Well, it turns out we actually have all of this technology available. So uh, what, are, what are the different ingredients that we have? Well, we have the cloud, that's one component. And with the cloud, we can store infinite data Right, you can put uh, literally. You can't fill up the cloud. It's it's not possible to fill up the cloud. It, it also can do um, storage. It can do um, CPU. It can do um, uh, disk I/O. So so basically, it has the ability to do um, both computational and also the storage requirements for for any bit of data. We also have enough of an understanding of the algorithms around computer vision and deep learning. We, we have enough, we have enough skills to, to do this. Uh, and we also have specialized hardware and we'll get into this in a little bit. We have specialized hard, hardware that can do these predictions. And so one, one question I think that the world should ask themselves is that, and this is just one of, of many problems, is why are we not doing this? <laughs> why, 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 why are not, you know, why can't we not detect instantly in every location in the world whether someone's wearing a mask or not and then stop it? Like if someone's spreading COVID, stop it. You know, likewise, there's lots of other problems like this, like heart attacks. Like we, we probably have enough to do heart attacks. Well, one of the one of the detect heart attacks. But one of the problems is that we have a tolerance for manual tasks. And and this is my opinion: is that is it why um, is computer vision not more widely adopted? We have the technology. But it's it's more of the will, more adopted, and, and and so part of it is that we have a tolerance for for manual um, tasks. So so we have tolerance for you know button pushing essentially, uh, and, and we're also focused too much on the the code, we're too, code math. And, and technique focus. These are all um, areas that people are focused on. And re researchers 
they they need to get on they need to focus on this because it's it's helpful to have people develop new techniques but at the same time if nobody's using your code then it doesn't really matter and and a very good example of this would be the uh, company apple so apple um the the operating system it runs now is called os 10 and os 10 came from a company called next and what what was next well it was a um, operating system plus development tools that were de- were created by Steve Jobs and what was he trying to do he he said that it took um, several years so let's say one to two years to to build software uh, in in the enterprise and so he wanted to develop something that was 10x faster and so it turns out that he was right that that's why we have the iphone that's why we have os 10 operating system is that he he was passionate about making things 10x faster and so i think that the right now what what we're going to see is that there's a lot of emerging technology available that if you have an intolerance for doing things manually that you can very very quickly uh, get results and so we're and we're going to do this in, in this in this course so a, a good example of this would be um, so how, how could you build a prediction today like right now so that's let's just say this is uh, August um, you know 2020 how, how do I build a prediction that that works and put put it into production well today I can use Google AutoML that I can take a model and I can um, train it by just uploading the data and, and then uh, it'll automatically put that onto a edge device like my phone, like an iPhone or, or Android phone. I- immediately, in the end, I've got an application. It can do computer vision. Also, we have tools like Ludwig, which is open source AutoML. Um, and with uh, open source Ludwig, we can we can also um, build a computer vision model, and then do the same thing. We could put that onto our our phone. We could put it onto you know a, a device. Um, we could also, uh, for example, use transfer learning. That's another technique that we'll get into in a second. So we could take somebody else's pre-existing model and we could download it and then we could just tweak it a little bit and then from there we could we could put that onto some kind of device and, and, and get a solution. So even today, right now, you there's at least three or more where you barely have to write any code or no code. And, and you can just start building computer vision models, putting them on some device and getting results. And so the, the main reason people aren't doing this is that they're focused, they, 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 they don't wanna focus on something that makes their job easier. They're focused on the code. And th- there, there are some benefits to focus on the code, but it, but it can prevent you from getting a solution created. In my opinion, you should start first with the business problem and then focus on the approach to solving the business problem so so let's draw that out so what this means is that so how 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 do you get 10x results so how do you how to get 10x well what what you can do is say what is a what's the problem and then B, what tools can I use to solve it? And then how quick can I solve it? And then D would be, is it good enough? And if it's good enough, then you're done. If not, then maybe you go in and you make the, the, the coding more complex or you get a different algorithm or you, but, but I, think, I think that's one of the things that we're not doing right now that, that we're gonna do in this class is how do you get results quickly where you don't focus on 
the algorithms or deep learning neural networks or all this uh, technique, but you focus on the business problem and, and you get into it. So let's let's go ahead and now get into this notebook a little bit and talk about this. So with that in mind, um, one thing I, I will bring up is that there is some really good documentation about just high level. Uh, you know what is uh, what what are the things that that you can do with with um, deep learning from this link here MIT deep learning basics so let's just briefly overview this um, very good article by Lex Friedman and so one of the things he talks about in this article and you can read it on your own is that um, there are these these different styles so we've got supervised learning unsupervised learning and then reinforcement learning and the main way to think about this is that for um, a feed forward, feed forward neural network, convolutional neural network, and recurrent neural network, um, and an encoder decoder architecture, these are all things where you can see that this is this is would take an image, and it would be able to do a prediction. Um, this encoder decoder architecture takes an image and is able to do a prediction. Uh, but then in, in terms of an unsupervised machine learning problem, this is when you don't know what the correct answer is. So this would be where you're trying <coughs> you're trying to um, explore what the ideas are. So you're trying to explore, um, for example, uh, you know, how, how, how a label actually exists. Or in the case of a generative adversarial network, you're actually trying to figure out whether something's true or fake or, or fake. And then in terms of reinforcement learning, this is something that the um, AWS Deep Racer does, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, you you basically train it to uh, listen to a, re to, to a reward, and then it will take actions based on that. So it's like training a pet or training a, you know, a, a, a baby or something like that. So this is just super, super high level uh, overview of, of how it works. So we can really just stick with this and then start to build on it and, and without getting necessarily into the code start to to, to create uh, solutions so next up let's um look at this thing called uh, tensorflow playground now what i like about this tensorflow playground link here is that it's a great way to also look at a problem without writing any code so in this particular example here, we see that there's um, epochs, learning rate, activation function, regularization, regularization rate, problem type. These are all different kinds of uh, hyperparameters that you could tune. And without me needing to write any code at all, I can look at a data set. In this case, this is um, a classification problem. So you see problem type classification. And I'm going to to basically create a boundary around these two sets of data. So we've got uh, an X and a Y. I have these four neurons here, which are gonna learn the information, and then we're, we're gonna be able to predict between these. So how do I uh, train this thing? I can just click on this button, and we can see it starts to learn, um, the neural network starts to learn how to solve a problem. And notice that what's happening here is we train it, and then we take the trained model and, we, and then we validate it against the test set. And the test set is, is data that hasn't seen the, the, the training data. Uh, and you can see here that I think it's, it's, it's slightly overfitting. Okay, there we go. So once, once it gets to about 832 epochs or 832 iterations, we can finally get essentially like a perfect solution that we can figure out a boundary. But the art of deep learning and this is what a lot of the AutoML does or high-level tools do, is that they can automatically pick some of these things for us. So if you think about this, this seems very like boring or, or human, like clicking buttons. Why do I, we've got everything here. Why can't I just automate this? And so let, I'll show you, I think we can automate a lot of this. If I go here and I change the learning rate, to a slightly higher learning rate. This just means that it's slightly more aggressive about how it learns, and so it may come up with a, an answer quicker. So remember, this was 832. If I refresh this, and I keep that learning rate at 0.1, let's see if we can beat it. So we can see here that um, it is going to, 
zero, zero. There we go. So we, it's three times faster, right? Be, so I just tweaked a hyperparameter. But again, this is like a, a very manual, boring process kind of going back and forth here. So I, I think one takeaway is that uh, if you do want to, to get the intuition around neural networks, you can, you can get the intuition by looking at simulations without writing any code. And also, you can think about the fact that maybe initially, if you're going to prototype something, um, that, that you can not worry about this stuff and let a, a, a tool like Google AutoML or Ludwig or, or, or some other tool solve this initially. And then if you have to, you can go back into there. So it's, so it's like you're, you're essentially saying, look, this part of the problem, if I have to get into it, I will. And later I can tune these knobs. But initially, let's just get something that's good enough so that I can focus on the business problem, which we, we, which we described before is, do I, can I detect whether people have a mask or not? Right, which is a very specific problem. So if I go back here, um, that again, this is just more of like an intuition behind um, deep learning basics. So let's talk about some of these new, uh, you know, techniques. We know that the generative modeling here was an unsupervised uh, um, emerging computer vision technology, and in particular, this I think is an interesting one to look at. Is this um, Colab notebook set here where uh, it shows you all of these different models that um, can generate music. And so that's one of the things you can do with uh, this generative modeling. So you can, uh, in this case, train a new model on some data and then turn it into something else. So let's see, uh, I think I saw a couple examples here. So this one has everything you need to upload your own sounds and then this can reconstruct and interpolate them between a GPU at no cost, or uh, this one shows you how to generate new performed composition from a trained data set. So that looks kind of interesting. So what, what you would do is, you because it's re reinforcement um, learning, what would happen is, I'm sorry, recurrent neural network, it would be able to generate music uh, based on what you, what you fed it. And so you can see here that this model is trained on a uh, Yamaha data set, and uh, they're able to actually go through here and, and use it to automatically generate new new bits of information. So you can kind of play this out, play around with this in, I think it's right here, our open source Magenta repository. So you could you could look through this example, and there's a Colab notebook right here which is the one that we could we could look at which is which again is, is is pretty neat i could go through here and and train my own music uh and 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 then generate new new music uh, dynamically so this is one emerging um technology in in, in computer vision uh, and so we'll get into that a little bit in a second uh the the other thing that you can do with it, and this is a good link for you to take a look at, is that with uh, generative modeling, the, the core concepts are that you have uh, a, the ability to generate new new data instances, and also you can discriminate between a, a fake and a real one. And so a good example of this would be that, um, if we go over here, as, as, you're, as you're building this system, you're, you're getting better and better at, at both. So you're getting better at uh, generating fakes and you're also getting better at, at realizing uh, which one is fake and which one is real. So it's, you're, you, that, that's one of the things that's interesting about this, this kind of a system is that um, you have a random input generator, you generate samples, and then you're able to, to both generate fakes and, and figure out which ones are, are fake. And so that's, the, the core concept around what's happening when you see all these deep fakes that, that people are doing is they're using this generative uh, adversarial network. So let's also talk about uh, another uh, emerging technology that I talked about was this, um, this transfer learning concept. And what's interesting about transfer learning is that the um, TensorFlow framework in particular uh, makes a lot of the models available in something called TF Hub. And 
uh, what TF Hub does is it lets you uh, download models uh, inside of their their essentially like a repository of models and then build off of those models. And so in this particular example here, this would be an example of of how you could use both the uh, generative modeling um, stuff that we talked about earlier, plus also use a pre-trained model. So uh, in this particular example here, I think we have this, maybe I'll show this other one actually. I'll show this one, I think, because it's already, yeah, this is a, a, a another one. So I, I go to TF Hub here, and I'll, and I'll op open this up for you so you can see what it is. <clears throat> So TF Hub is where the um, pre-trained models are, are living, are living, and you can grab these. You could you could use this on your final project. For example, you could go in here and and look for um, some sample that's good enough, like celebrities or you know um, image image object recognition or flowers, or you can just scroll through here and 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 look at TensorFlow Hub and say. Okay, I wanna look at images. I wanna find image augmentation, image classification. Now, the image aug augmentation is, we, we won't necessarily get into this right now, but that's, that's actually a very interesting one in that if you're having problems with the accuracy of your, of your data set, this is another thing you can do is you could actually go through and create a bunch of augmented images that make your model um, train better. But in this particular, case if I look at image classification you can see here that I could get a bunch of you know landmark recognition or image classification and look these are actually created even in some cases by AutoML already for you so, so you can you can use these as like like a starter kit without having to necessarily even train it uh, yourself and, and and so what they do is they pull one from there and then they they use that to actually start to generate this transformation and interpolate between two different images. So they're taking this this um, generative adversarial network model uh, and, and then and then using it. And so what what this model does is it goes through and it shows you how you could um, build a solution yourself that that um, is able to kind of go from one different picture to another uh, and th again the, the the core idea here is that you're using an existing project uh, that that google gave you that has a lot of information in it already and then you're just kind of tweaking that that project another example would be this one which is um going more into actually just directly transfer learning what transfer learning does is allows you to to leverage the hard work of maybe a company like Google or AWS or some large company. And so you can see here we're here what it says at the, the beginning. It says for an image classification problem, um, you have to learn about, uh, you know, all kinds of fancy stuff and it's complicated, but you can take a shortcut. And in this case, there are fully trained convolutional neural networks available for download. Uh, so again, this would be something you could use on your on your project. And it's possible to just chop the last layer off and then have a softmax classification head and replace it with your own. All the trained weights and biases stay at this, as they are, and you only retrain the softmax layer you add. This technique is called transfer learning, and amazingly, it works as long as the data set is close enough. So how would we do this? Well, first let's look at the, the information here. So you could, someone who's got a PhD in um, deep learning or something like that from Stanford or Harvard, or they, they could go through here and figure out all this complicated neural network topology. And then you could say, thanks. And then you just delete that last bit of what they did. And then you put your piece there. So I think this would be another project that I would hopefully one of you tries is that uh, all you need to do is just put this code in like that and so that's what this is is you just take that last piece off so you could again go in and build all that stuff but 
what I think is interesting is is as just a uh, more of like a thought experiment, why not try to see what kind of results you can get by using pre-trained models and and tweaking that last layer. And so in this particular example, they use Keras and then they um, slightly change the model and they add that new um, activation function. And then with this particular uh, model here, you can see here, if we click on it, you get actually 75% accuracy with, and all, all, all that happened was that um, you're able to actually use something that already existed. So I think this one, if we look through here, they pull the images down. Here's the images. They they then um, build the training and validation set. They then um, uh, use a pre-trained model right here. They tweak the last uh, layer right here and they add in their activation function and then it tells you what the model looks like and then uh, they train it, they train it again, and you can see that uh, here is the model accuracy, <clears throat> and then they can go through and make predictions directly with that. So pretty amazing actually, in a way, because you 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 um, can 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 basically just use somebody else's uh, work and get a pretty good model. And you can see here they sh they give you all the different results just by by just tweaking a little a little bit of code. So I, I think these are the kind of techniques that that um, really could be w great solutions to 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 getting more on the engineering side uh, of um, of computer vision. So that's that's transfer learning uh, in a, in a nutshell. So I guess to summarize these these topics here, these emerging topics, what I would say is that there's no shortage of classes online about neural networks and how to build them and all that. And, and a lot of times I think the problem is the complexity is so high that people either give up or they, they take a long time doing all the neural networks. But what I see less of and what I would encourage you to do is how quick can you use something that's an advanced technique to get to the solution so that you can build something. If it turns out that later you need to dig in deep, then go, go for it, right? Go ahead and build something but at first, try uh, one of these advanced techniques that makes you take shortcuts, right? So transfer learning, um, TF Hub, uh, AutoML, these are all things to think about. So let's, let's keep going though, and let's go to another topic. Uh, so in, in terms of um, uh, reinforcement learning, uh, there, there's a really interesting um, library called OpenGym. And what OpenGym does is it's a toolkit for developing and comparing reinforcement learning algorithms. It makes no assumptions about the structure of your agent, and it's compatible with any numerical computation library such as TensorFlow or Theano. And uh, the, what, what you do is you just do pip install gym. You, build, you can also build it from source here. Uh, and here's an example of one of the things that it does is it goes through and it, uh, it, sh it prints out this cart pull and so what we want to do is we want to train it to stay up um, straight, right? So we want it to just to, to be like this. So how would we do this? Well, the way we would do this uh, is that um, you would need to go through and modify some of these parameters. So you would need to uh, be aware that, that there's an observation. So this is an object. You'd also need to be aware that there's a reward. Uh, there's a done and, and there's an info. And so the way this works is you have an agent, it takes an action to an environment, and you have observation and a reward. And so this process um, gets called by calling the reset, which returns an, an initial observation. And you can see here, this is kind of the feedback loop that, you, that you're developing. And so once it's been trained, you can see that's, that's the result. That's a, that's a, the, the, a correct uh, answer. So if we go back to our code here, here's one of the things that you could work on is you could go through here and um, pip install gym. And then we, if we wanted to, I could install this um, cart pool application. Let's go ahead and run that. 
There we go. And in this particular example, this would be something you could build on your own for your homework or build a, um, a, a deep racer project, which I'm going to show you in a second. And so if you did want to do this yourself, some of the ideas I would say would be avoid ghosts, eat the energizer pellet, go left, go right, randomly go right, left, eat regular pellets, find open spaces. But there's a bunch of links here. So, so here's something that I built that's that's just more of like a thought experiment. And you know, I, I go through here and I create some actions. Maybe I go through and I build up an action list, and then I go through and I say for this in range, print next action. So I could kind of build out like a sequence of events that I want to do. So if you wanted to start to build on that, what you could do is install these dependencies, and they're right here. Once you install these dependencies, the next thing that you would do would be to, um, when that's done, do these Pac-Man dependencies, which we'll do in a second. And then we will run these helper methods here. There we go. And now I'm gonna do uh, virtual display and then I'm gonna click on this and this is a utility function that just shows like the, the video and then if we want to look at Pac-Man here's an example I can go through here and I could I could see the results of a, a Pac-Man so this is where you would put your code that would go through and, and, and retrain it this is just the example like that that they, that they come with but then if you wanted to train this yourself, you would have to give it rewards. And then based on those rewards, it was it would slightly change its behavior. And, and as it learned more and more optimal techniques, um, you could you could have something that completed the level, essentially. So that's really the, the, the core concept behind uh, reinforcement learning. So what we can do next is I'm going to go to... Um, Deep Racer next, which is like a more advanced version of this. So let's go to uh, Deep Racer here, and I'm gonna log in. Put in my passcode here. All right, so <clears throat> in this particular um, project called again Deep Racer, uh, what, what's what's neat about it is that it's a reinforcement learning project that allows you to train a, a vehicle, and you can actually get a physical vehicle. And I actually have it in my house, or you can train it uh, a virtual vehicle. And so basically, you train it to go back around different kinds of tracks, and you can actually enter global competitions uh, as well. And so, um, if I go to the um, getting started guide, I can kind of walk you through this. So the the start of this is that in order to get started with reinforcement learning. Uh, you, you go through and learn the basics of reinforcement learning, which we'll do right now. You would then go through and create a model. And this would, again, very very similar to the Pac-Man. It would define the reward function, hyperparameters, action space. We would train the model, so observe the agent, interact with the environment, evaluate it, and then also join the, the Deep Racer League. So what we do first here is uh, start the reinforcement learning um, uh, you know, walk through here. So, uh, what is reinforcement learning? We we already talked about it, but let's let's go do an overview again. It's when an agent explores an environment to learn how to perform uh, desired actions with good outcomes and avoid actions with bad outcomes. So again, a lot like a pet, you know, or a child, it is that I don't know if you've had you know pets before, but but I have a, a husky. And uh, when I tell the husky at night, 
I want you to go into the crate, the husky goes. <laughs> and, and why? Because the husky knows that I will give the husky a treat. <laughs> and then it, it goes, it, it knows it's going to get a reward. And so this, it's the same concept exactly with, with this is that you're going to um, have this agent. And so instead of a dog, it's a, it's a car. You're going to give it a reward and then uh, it's going to take an action based on that. And then you're going to measure what happens. And so in this particular um, uh, type of machine learning, it is different than supervised because in supervised, you have labeled data. So you have, let's say, house prices or you have classification, like you have the credit card offer was accepted or credit card offer was declined. You know, you have you have known good data and you're training to predict the future. Um, or an unsupervised, this would be that you don't know what it is you're trying to find, but you cluster the data. So there's a totally different kind of machine learning where the, the thing you're trying to do is train something over and over again to, to solve a problem. And so this is a computer vision um, problem. So let's go next here and uh, look into how does a deep racer learn to drive by itself. Well, in reinforcement learning, an agent interacts with an environment where the objective is to maximize its total reward. And so the agent takes an action based on the environment state and the environment returns the reward and the next state. So the agent learns from trial and error. And initially though, you, you would a lot of times want to take random actions, just like we were, we were seeing earlier, so that you can start to discover your environment. So let's look at how this relates to the deep racer again is, that you have an agent, this agent simulates the deep racer vehicle. Uh, and uh, in particular, it's gonna take inputs and then decide what to do. So the environment in our in, in the Pac-Man game, the environment was the Pac-Man board. In the deep racer, the environment is actually this board, uh, is, is the, is the uh, track, right? And so there's different environments actually for deep racer. And, and so in this particular uh, world, this is what we're discovering. Now, a state represents a snapshot of the environment the agent is in at that point in time. So for Deep Racer, uh, it could be an image captured by the front-facing camera on the vehicle, right? So I have a camera, I'm looking at this track, and I'm, uh, and I'm taking you know, a picture of it. Uh, and in particular, there's the steering, and then there's a throttle are, are two of the actions, right? So you, you, know, you turn left or right, you, you press the gas or you let off the gas. Uh, and, and so those are the those are the actual actions that that you want this thing to to take, and also the reward again, just like an animal, you you tell your animal to go into the crate, you give it a treat. In this case, the reward is um, that when it takes an action and it's the good action, then you give it a reward. And so this reward is a reward function, and you can write this yourself in Python. It's very very simple actually to to write this um, reward function. So um, how to train uh, a reinforcement learning model. So training a uh, reinforcement learning model is an iterative process and a simulator explores the environment and builds up the experience. And the experience collected are used to update the neural network periodically and the updated models are used to create more experiences. So with DeepRacer, you're training a vehicle to drive itself and it can be tricky to visualize the process of training. So let's take a look at the simplified example. So if we go through here, uh, in this example, we would want to go the shortest path, right? That's somewhat intuitive is that uh, I would want it to go directly across the finish line because it would get there quicker. Uh, now, how would we do this? Well, we could def divide that into different rewards. So if it, if, if it went through and, and landed on every single one of these, then we would get the highest total reward. Uh, but if it starts to veer off, then we would, we would lower the reward because we don't want to encourage it to um, go off the track. And then in this case, if it goes completely off the track, there's no reward. Right, so so basically, if if the vehicle um, would veer off of the track, it would give very low reward. But if the but if the vehicle completes all the way through, then it would get the highest reward. Uh, so how would this work? So in one episode, you would go through and, and and see what kind of reward you would get. And so this is what happens initially too, is that 
you have to have a balance between you want to explore things, but you also want to maximize the reward. So there's a there's a trade off here. And in this particular episode, uh, the total uh, reward is 2.2. So we go here 2.2. There we go. So an iteration would be that your the model will learn which action will result in the highest cumulative reward on the way to the goal. And the learning uh, doesn't just happen on the first go, it takes some iteration. So first the agent needs to explore and see where it can get to the highest reward before it can exploit that knowledge. Right, so if I go through here, you can see that it, it goes through over and over and over again. And and we well, again, what we're trying to do is maximize the, the highest reward uh, so that we know that the highest reward will lead to the, the straightest path uh, through the course. Uh, now, another thing that, that, that comes to mind though, and this is this trade-off between exploitation and convergence is that there's, there's an optimal strategy where at some point initially you want some randomness so that it knows what it's doing and it knows what the boundaries are uh, and before uh, it, it, it exploits it. And so that's just one of the things that happens in a reinforcement learning model. So a best, you know, a good way to think about this would be the, um, a robot vacuum cleaner for a house, right? Is that you would want to encourage it initially to explore, you know, some of the house. Otherwise, how would it know where the rooms are in the house? before you start to optimize everything. <coughs> so you want to both encourage exploration and then also convert, encourage the, the reward to be, to be high. So, so next, um, here, here's a parameters of a reward function uh, in DeepRacer. So in uh, ADBOS DeepRacer, uh, this is a Python function that um, you can give us certain parameters and then it will, it will give you back what the state is. So it could be a position on the track, a heading, waypoints, track width, distance from the center line, um, all wheels on the track, speed, um, steering angle. Those are all could be good examples. And so in this particular example here, we've got an X and a Y. And so the X and the Y would describe the position of the vehicle in meters, and they would be measured from the lower left corner uh, of the environment. Right, so we go through here and we see uh, all the positions of, of, of the vehicle. Uh, heading is another one. So like, you know, wh what is the, the actual angle that the, the vehicle is on, right? This would be something that you, would, you could look at when you're building your reward function. Uh, also uh, waypoints. So this, this really just shows you which segment you're on uh, in the track. Uh, and track width is another one, right? So. Uh, you know where where you know where are you actually uh, on the track uh, according to the width and then the distance from the center line and then is is it left of center line so this is this it, it really depends on the the kind of track that you're on but but it could be that one of the things that you're doing is it's a curvy track and so you want to actually maybe go a little bit farther than you would on a straighter track to to uh, you know distance from the center and then all wheels on the track so this is another one that would show you whether maybe the vehicle is is getting too aggressive <laughs> it's going too much off of the track as as soon as one one of the wheels is off then that's something that potentially you would want to account for uh, in your reward function and then speed another one so depending on what kind of problem you're solving, there, and there's lots of different problems. It could be obstacles, maybe speed, you wanna keep your speed a little lower. But if, if you're a time trial, maybe you want your speed to be very fast, right? So it just depends on, on what it is you're, you're building your reward function to do. And then again, steering angle. So which, how, how hard are you turning the, the wheel um, right or, or left? And then basically they give you a breakdown of these three, 13 different parameters here. Uh, and you can read more about the documentation as well. So all that stuff goes together to allow you to build this uh, reward function. Now, now, fortunately, it's actually very straightforward. So, so this is, I would say, probably easier than um, even the OpenAI gym because 
that's it. <laughs> the only, that's all you need to build is a, this Python function. And they give you an example here where um, you, this, this example is a high reward for when the car stays on the track and it penalizes it if it deviates from the track boundaries. So in this example, the um, it uses all wheels on the track, distance from the center, track width, to determine whether the car is on the track and gives a high reward if so. So this function doesn't reward any specific behavior besides um, stay on the track. And you can even see, like this shows you a little bit of, of how it would work. I won't run it too much because it makes me motion sick to, to look at it. But here we go, all wheels on the track, distance from the center, track width, right? So you pretty easy to play around with this. You just go through and try different um, try different parameters to put inside of here or, or even change this, right? Like this is just an algorithm or, or a, a heuristic is if all the wheels on the track and 0.5 times track width minus distance from the center is greater than 0.05, give the reward one, right? So you could, again, just play around with how you want to tweak that reward function. Uh, maybe, may, maybe you don't care about wheels on the track. Maybe uh, you only care about track width and distance, all things that you could, again, play around with. Here's another one that they give you, which is follow the center line. And so this example, uh, you measure how far away the car is from the center of the track, and you give a higher reward if the car is close to the center line. Uh, there we go. And, and you can see in this particular example here, this is a reward function, and this reward function um, is able to uh, give you a uh, a few different things that you normally wouldn't get. So if the distance from the center is less than marker one, uh, reward is equal to one. If the distance from the center is less than marker two, um, reward is 0.5. You know, so basically what this one does is you're, is you're rewarding it to to kind of hug the center, so so that um, that's that's really what you're you're trying to optimize, and then another one. This would be like more like chaos, is is what you say is you just always give it the same reward as long as the car doesn't crash. You just like okay, here we go. You always get the same reward, and so this is more of like this could take a long time to get a really good behavior, but it could actually figure out something that's really cool because or, or really efficient because it, it, it um, is non-deterministic, right? Like it, it just is gonna randomly try to, to go around the track and, and as long as it doesn't crash, it, it eventually might, well, I guess in theory, uh, if it ran long enough, it would eventually find the optimal solution, but it could take forever. Well, the good news though about training something like this is there's not a lot to learn, right? You, you just return back one, which is the highest reward as long as the car doesn't crash. Um, and so how, how would we go through and build our own model here? So if we wanted to build our own model, we, we would um, just go through here and build out. Uh, so again, this reward agent, state, reward, environment, action. So we could make a new model here. It says you know, build, um, uh, build new model. This is a new model here that we could go to uh, an environment simulation and we could pick which track that we want to run this on. So a speedway, um, so Yun, Yun Speedway is Chinese word for cloud. Uh, and so maybe that's a good one. We'll, we'll try that one. And then um, you can see there's a bunch of different tracks here to, to, to try. So we'll go through this. And then you can pick which kind of race. You can either do time trial race, uh, object avoidance, or head-to-head -head racing. Um, and then you also can pick which vehicles you have in your garage. I think right now they only have one vehicle, but in the future they're probably going to have other vehicles, like maybe like drones even, I, I would bet. But for now, we go through here and we say time trial, we say next, and um, 
from here, let me just show you all the different things that it gives you. So it, it gives you like an example reward function and, and you can just start tweaking it from here. So you can say, um, you know, what are the input parameters and then give a higher reward if the car is closer to the center line, right? So this is again, just an example here, but um, uh, I, could, I could just start with this and just keep that. And the other thing we can do is we can change the algorithm and also a hyperparameter. So in this particular example, this is a state-of-the-art uh, gradient algorithm which uses two neural networks during training, a policy network and a value network. And so in this example, these are hyperparameters. We do gradient descent batch size, and you could change that. Um, you could also change the number of epochs. So we know that's like how many times uh, it's going to learn on each um, on each run. A learning rate, like you could also tweak this, maybe make it go a little bit higher or lower, right? Um, I forgot actually which, maybe I'll reset this. I'll reset. I think it was, let me actually go back here to this model and we'll say new model training keep everything the same <clears throat> so the i think we were we were here so so basically you can you can change all these things um, and, and these would all be things that potentially can make it go faster and then this this is a stop condition. So this sets the condition for your, your training job to stop. And so to avoid runaway jobs, you can limit the length of a job to within a maximum time period. Uh, and also you can automatically submit your results to the league. So uh, it the cost is about 350 per hour, but you can use the free tier initially. Uh, and so um, you can see that the free tier gives you 10 free hours, right? So you can you can basically use this in the class easily uh, and, and not not worry about it and you won't won't be charged for it. But I'm going to go through here and say uh, create model. And from here, this is pending completion. And this the training is actually um, not too bad to, to do the training. So we'll let we'll just let this go. And, and um, what I will do is show you a model that I've trained previously here. So uh, we can go through here and we can see that this one is, this is for class, this was one I did here. And if I click on it, uh, you can see that the training was, when it was complete, it shows me a reward graph and it shows all of the iterations. And then again, we're trying to optimize uh, for the highest reward. So in this one, we got a, a pretty good reward uh, up here. And then while it's training, what one of the things that you'll see is that it will even show you a simulation of what the car is doing while, while it's running. So you'll see it doing the things that, that, you're, that you're trying to, to train it to do. Um, and then uh, as well, when it's done, it will show you the evaluation results. So in this one, this one wasn't too good, is that um, each time I did the evaluation, it, it was crashing and it crashed pretty early. It crashed 10%, 13%, 11%. Um, and then it will also tell me the different uh, training configurations. So like it tells me the hyperparameters, the environment, uh, it, and it even shows the reward function as well. So we see here is the, the reward function. Um, so, so I can look at previous runs here. Uh, and if I wanted to, I could even submit this. This one's not good. This is not, a, so I'm not gonna submit it. But if, if I go back, I think I had one that I did recently that was pretty good. Let's maybe look at this one. Let's see. Yeah, so this one was actually, I did this just recently. And you can see that in, in the evaluation, I was actually able to get 100% um, completion each time. And 
uh, so this one was pretty good. And if I look at, I was training on the Shanghai pseudo training environments, and here's my reward function uh, right here. And then uh, I also, it'll show you each of the, the different action spaces as well. So these are all things that if you were building this over and over again, you, you would go through and, and, and tweak depending on, on how successful your, your um, simulation worked. And then again, you can go here and we could just do this real quick. You can say submit to the August uh, qualifier. And so this will, will um, submit this to the, a different rate. So you can train it on one, you can train it on one um, uh, track, but you can obviously, it, it, the, the algorithm that, that, it's, that it's using or the information that it learned is probably good enough where you could actually uh, use it on another one as well. So in this case, if I, if I submit this, we can, we can see how it does. And so we can see your model was submitted. Your, your race results will be available in 10 minutes. So then what it's gonna do is it's, even though this is a totally different track, it's gonna, it's gonna put this into here and then it'll let me know how it, how it did and it'll do a, a full simulation. So I, I think this is a pretty good thing to be aware of. And it's and it really gives you a, a like a great understanding of of um, like real world computer vision, uh, and what what also is nice about it is that you also can buy the the vehicle as well. So you can actually train this and then get the deep racer vehicle, and then actually apply that model and run it in your house at the same time. So the deep racer vehicle, if you're not aware of it um is if we go here to the garage it looks just like this uh and it has a front it has a front facing camera and i think i have this here we go you you um th there's a whole picture here and i think let me just grab it real quick uh, it looks Yeah, so it looks it looks like this. So you can see like here's the here's the deep racer vehicle, and you you can you can mod it. You can put your own battery in there, and then and then this this particular section here. This is where the this is where that front camera is. So it looks just like this. So uh, I haven't yet I've only trained it, but I haven't put it on the device yet. Um, but in terms of like, again, real world computer vision, this is one of the more interesting, uh, I think, devices to, to, to play around with. So let's, let's see what we've got left here. We've got, this one is still training. And I think we can watch it while it's training. So you can see the simulation video here. And let's see, so it's in progress. And yeah, here we go. So it'll it'll show you like like simulations while it's while it's training, which is which is pretty interesting. So that there we go. It failed, right? So so that's as far as it got. So it's, there we go. And then it, it's gonna it's gonna redo uh, another episode every time it goes off of the track. Then, then it has to start over again because um, th those are the parameters of the test. So, but but what's good about watching it while it's training is that you get you get a pretty good feel for for you know how the model is generalizing and 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 and, and actually how it's doing. What I don't know though is is are you starting is it progressing or is it starting in the same spot? I believe that it is it looks like it's progressing down the track like it keeps going to to new uh sections of the track but i'm not 100 percent sure actually i think it oh, actually there we go it, it, it shows you where it, where it's at so where does it start oh so i think it starts i th i think they keep yeah they keep letting you start from where you left off when they're training and they show you exactly where it is so here we go this is our best model um 
and they and they show the maximum time. So so I think it can train for up to an hour. Uh, and, and again, you can see <laughs> that one was going backwards. Uh, the other thing, once it's done training as well, that you, you you can look at the logs, but but yeah, in, in, in a nutshell, you can you can watch it while while it trains. So that's like the 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 main thing. That's I guess interesting initially. The other thing that that I was going to show was this race. I don't know. Um, Oh, it's okay. There we go. It's evaluating the, the time. So this one says the best time was uh, 47 seconds. Uh, I submitted this and it's still under evaluation. So we should be able to see this in just a, just a few minutes. So let's see what else uh, is available here. Uh, in terms of this is a list of all your models and you can resubmit those models if you wanted to. And then in terms of, uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell is, is, is to, to use this, to use the deep racer, uh, I would say, um, you know, create a, create a free tree account. And let, let me just go through that real quick. So you, you see this. So in order to use AWS, what you need to do is you can just type in free tier AWS. And this applies to, if you haven't used it before, you can just say create free account. And this doesn't expire. And uh, it's available to uh, all customers. And in particular, for 12 months, you get a bunch of uh, free services. And I believe if we go to the robotics section here if you click on robotics this is where all of the this is where you you'll see a lot of this here is like i think deep deep racer behind the scenes uses um the robotics the, the robo maker so let's see here deep yeah i think i think it just it, it's is basically Basically, Robo Maker is the thing that costs the money, and you get twenty five hours for free um, in, in order in order to use uh, Robo Maker. And if we go back here to uh, training the model, we say create a model. I believe that it tells us that. I forget where it says that when you're when you're creating the model, but but basically it it tells you that you you can you can train a model using the free tier. So, so that's how I would start is, is again, getting a free tier uh, available in order to do this, this training on your own. So again, we can maybe wait for a second here to go back to uh, this model and see if anything new has happened. So we see, okay, now it's getting a little bit better. So we can see that it found an even higher reward here. So in theory, it should be getting, it should be improving the reward, right? Because we're maximizing the total reward because it's learning how better to to drive. So it does, it does actually look like it's doing a little bit better. It doesn't crash as often now, because and, and remember that this this particular function that we're training, it's it's we're, we told it to optimize to try to stay by the center line. And I guess you can see where it starts to crash is when it, it doesn't seem like it does well when there's a sharp turn. Like it seems like it's okay when, when, it, when there's not a sharp turn, but, but when there's a very sharp turn, it, although that, that did okay. Yeah, this, 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 this particular run seems like it's doing doing reasonable so this has been running for 11 minutes after and then after again after it's evaluated then then after it's trained then we can then we can evaluate it 
I guess if I go back again to this race, does it? Um, it's still it's still evaluating my my race here. So, so the one thing the one thing you do have to do though is have a little bit of patience when you're when you're working with this is that a lot of the stuff is a little bit slow. Now, did that finish training? Is that twelve oh eight? No, it's now it's doing another one. So I guess it did find our best model was twenty nine. And let's see if it gets a little bit better. You can see that one thing that this is not that good at is average percentage completion is pretty low, right? You can see that it is a pretty low completion rate here for for this particular um, model. So, yeah, maybe, maybe that's a good place to I'll check one more time to see if this race, if it gave me back results. Oh, there we go. So, so it says uh, my my rank is not that good. It's eight thirty four out of eleven. But if I go to my fastest time was three minutes, but the best time was forty seven seconds. So, so maybe one of the takeaways here would be that I should train it on um, I should train it on the actual track right that it that it's going to use instead of training it on a, some di some different track that might be one one way to to consider it but in a nutshell pr pretty pretty fun to to play around with this uh, and it does it does show you uh, the power of of what you can do with um, with reinforcement learning and, and again it's it's about setting these rewards, letting the thing train, uh, and, then, and then building things. So I guess what we can do is um, maybe just summarize some of the things that we learned here. So I'm going to go back to this and just summarize what, what we went over is that in this particular class, what, what's, in, what's important to think about is, is the speed, right? So so can you can you focus on the the business so focus on the, the business problem and, and so what is the business problem you know again is it a, is it a mask uh, or is it a, a car you know or is it um object detection objects uh, or you know uh recycling garbage you know, um, sort you know sorting trash, and and then and then looking next here, like what are what are what are the quickest ways that I can solve it? And oftentimes the quickest way would be that first try a high level tool, and the high level tool could be a tool like um, AutoML. It could be transfer learning. It could be you know. Um, you know, reinforcement learning on a with a framework like uh, Deep Racer, uh, but but once you do that, then you can actually f create this feedback loop, where where the feedback loop is that you try an idea out. So you go through here and you say you 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 try an idea, and then like does it work? And then if it doesn't, you, you try another idea, and then you do the same thing, try another idea, and, and, and then you're, you're, you're focused on, on how quickly can I, can I get to, to solving a problem. So I'll just give you like a hint at, at, at why this is so useful and, and what you can do with this, because we're going to get into this next week, is if we look at um, uh, Google AutoML as an example, uh, this 
the Google AutoML system, uh, what what's neat about it is that you can uh, just literally click a button and it will automatically uh, figure out how to do object detection for you. And so uh, a good example of this would be if we go here and we'll just do AutoML Vision. Uh, if I go to this platform, I could just upload a bunch of data. And here's here's an example of some data I uploaded. <clears throat> here we go. Here's all the different data. And, and then I just click on train. And again, it's just a button. I just click on train. It trains it. Once I go to evaluate, then uh, I can go through here and get all the different results. It shows me everything. And, and to use it, uh, I can actually just download it into some framework like TensorFlow Lite or, or export it to a model, like into a piece of hardware like this. And then I'm able to uh, go to prototyping here, right? I could put it on, I, I think I have this, yeah, right here. So I could just put it onto a device like this and then I could just start making predictions. Uh, or uh, I could put it on even a smaller you know, piece of hardware like a 10 millimeter by a 15 millimeter. But the, the idea here is that you really don't have to write any code at all. You, you, can, you can upload your data, click train, put it onto a model, and just see does it even work. And, and, and I think that, that's, the, that's the feedback loop that we're gonna be embracing is is how quickly can you can you get some data try it out make a prediction on something you also could in, in theory as well go if i go back here also put where is this you could also put this on um uh, on your phone as well so you could you could go to like um and again we'll get into this but like you could go to to apple and uh download it onto their 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 framework and and first have trained it on on the on the Google Cloud. So so I think that's that's the big takeaway with with this kind of edge based computer vision is there's a lot of problems you can solve if you're able to to focus on the 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 solution first versus the technique and and if you need the technique to be better then make the technique better. But the, the, the difference is that there's actually, um, and, and, I'll, and I'll draw this out, one more thing before we go, is you, you, you can have a you can have a bad technique, but have a decent solution. So like, what are, what are the trade-offs for speed? So, so you, let, let's say the technique, the technique that you use uh, is, is like, is bad or even we'll just say, or okay, you still can, can solve the problem. Right, like you, you could, for example, say, I'm going to build the. And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be, you know, that the car that we're just showing, you know, or it could be the, the computer vision hardware with the, with your phone from Google. We'll call this Google AutoML. Or or this is Deep Racer. You could you could still have, like an okay result. Like in the case of the one that I, I submitted to the race, right, is that I had a bad result. It took, let's just say it took four minutes, but other people got 40 seconds. It still works. My, the, the, the car still gets around the track. It was very slow, but, but I solved the problem, right? I just solved the problem, but I, I, I solved it in a way that could be improved, but I solved it. Uh, but but if, but on the flip side, 
you you if you focus on the on only so if if the if you could have only technique and the technique is I'm not sure why that's so slow and the and the technique could be like very complex but you could have no solution which I've seen a lot is that is that if you only are focused on the code and the technique and you know like the the difficulty level it's possible that you never get anything working right so so that's that's one thing to consider when you're when you're trying to build something is that that you know you have to ask yourself here here's 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 approach a and here's approach b if if someone said i need you to create a solution that detects covid or, or um, masks people wearing masks or not and there's two people working on the problem one of them they have something that's like 80 percent of the time they can detect in the mask and then another person has something that looks like it could work and it could be very very good but it still doesn't work and it's 90 they they, they think they they can get to 99 percent accuracy but then and then, but then they don't do it, <laughs> and and they're waiting. They're still working on. It. They're still working on it. Uh, I'm, they're they're not necessarily completely um, diametrically opposed, but but I what in this class we're 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 focused on this, which is the technique can be bad. Just get something working quickly, and and, and later if, if you can figure out how to make the technique better. But but. You know, again, if 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 we're when you when you think about a crisis in particular like COVID, is it better to have something that's not that good but still works, or something that doesn't work but 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 in two years it might be really good? Like if it doesn't help solve a problem today, then how how is that useful to people? So so I think that's just something to think about in all the techniques that we talked about is is as you're building your final project is. Can you build something that can solve today a problem using the highest level tools that you, that you can?